uh, when we talk about things like free will or whether, you know, the basis of mathematical truths or realism, you know, whether there's a world out there at all, uh, whether they're moral truths, um, that these are questions for which we don't yet have, and maybe never will, by their very nature, have any uh, empirical evidence one way or the other, or can make really, you know, knock down arguments that are going to convince your opponents. And we, have, we bring great passion uh, to these, these discussions and to these uh, attitudes about these questions. My feeling is it's, these are intuitions, and what's so interesting about them is that they're individually variable. They, they vary from one individual to the next. Um, David Hume uh, had said that, you know, when where philosophical argument and evidence end, psychology comes into play, you know, and that, uh, so for example, uh, causality, you know, we can't justify uh, our belief in causality, you know, that there always is a, a cause for events and that it will continue in the future. Um, and yet, you know, even that doesn't stop any of us from believing it, and we couldn't survive if we didn't believe in it. And so he, I, I see uh, Hume as a sort of a predecessor in making the kind of argument that I'm making about philosophy, you know, that where reason ends and uh, argument ends and even empirical evidence ends, human psychology steps in. He, he says somewhere in the treatise on human nature, uh, that nature is too strong for us. And uh, so it steps in. The kinds of intuitions that I'm interested in, he was talking about intuitions that are shared by all of us, just in virtue of being human and uh, being reasonable characters. But um, kinds of uh, intuitions that I think are really interesting and that I haven't been paid much attention to um, are vary from one person to the next. Um, and I think if you look at the history of philosophy, uh, you can actually go through the great thinkers and say, what was that core intuition? And by core intuition, I mean um, the last thing you would give up um, in the face of recalcitrant experience. You know, what was the last thing? So Spinoza, who's a great favorite of mine, um, his core intuition, and everything kind of makes sense once you see this, is that reality is intelligible. There are always reasons for every fact. Nothing is just a brute fact. It's true because it's true and nothing else. No, you know, the way I like to put it, it's not turtles going all the way down, it's reasons going all the way down. And that is first, so that's like a core intuition of his. Um, for, for Hume, it's quite the opposite. It's like, no, it's contingency, you know, reason, stops. And it's not just that our reason stops, the reasons stop. They are just brute facts. Uh, for Kant, it's free will. He'll do anything. He'll change around any part of his system as long as he preserves free will, because we have to have free will for us to have moral responsibility. And so it's just a sort of fascinating um, uh, fact, I think, about philosophers. It's, it's not so much a philosophical philosophical point, it's sort of the psychology of philosophy. And I guess what I would want to argue is that a lot of psychology is in play um, in the history of philosophy, I mean, in philosophical discussions now when we radically disagree with each other about all sorts of philosophical uh, questions, that there is a temperament, there's personality, there is one's entire orientation towards you know, reality, or whether or not you want to say reality within scare quotes, or reality without scare quotes, as my intuition tells me to say. So I, I actually am, I'm, I'm, my own intuitions tell me, oh yes, no, there is objective truth, there really is truth out there. I'm a very strong realist, certainly when it comes to science, but actually mathematics, I'm a very strong realist when it comes to mathematics. I'm rather a strong realist when it comes to morality, and even aesthetics. So I, my intuition, is a realism, and that probably is my core orientation. And I, th and I think there's an objective truth there. I mean, in that sense, I think realism has to answer, you know, it, it's, it's kind of answers itself. It's sort of uh, because if somebody, you know, disagrees with me about realism, well, 
they're saying, well, that's what's really real. You know, that's, it's, 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 it's hard to not somehow come down on the side of objective truth and, and realism. Uh, but um, uh, it's a, an entirely different proposition to say that we can know reality and that we are ever certain of the truth. Um, I think quite often people merge the question of whether there's truth and whether realism is, is true um, with the epistemological question of whether we can know the truth um, and whether we can uh, you know, ever be certain of it. And, you know, and there, that's a totally different question. And I would say, yeah, no, I mean, the truth, if we know anything about it, um, or anything, is there anything that we ought to know about it, so it's very hard to come by. To me, it's pretty amazing given our evolutionary roots, right, <laughs> that we are evolved chimps, basically, um, that we know anything at all, you know, and that we have developed uh, these self-critical methodologies, both philosophy and, uh, and science and uh, the social sciences as well, to in interrogate uh, ourselves and so that we, we, we do approach closer and closer to, you know, something of the truth. You know, I, I, do, I do think that there's a tremendous amount that we don't know and possibly can never know. Uh, so that, uh, in fact, my realism commits me to that, right? I think, you know, because I think there really is a reality. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, some, some, we get a little glimmers of it. If we're very, very strict with ourselves and we're really uh, interrogate our own beliefs and we pool our shared knowledge and pool our resources that you know, we can know something. I, I think it's probably very little, uh, but, but enough for us to believe in truth. So yeah, by talking about intuitions, um, what I'm doing is talking about the limits on our own knowledge, uh, making more of a, a claim about um, knowledge rather than truth. We really do know that uh, there are laws of nature um, and that uh, we don't know all of them and we don't know why they are the laws of nature but we do know um, something about the laws of nature through science and always we know it's not the last word we keep correcting ourselves there was Newton but then you know came Einstein and relativity theory to correct Newton to show that it was only a, a, a limiting case and when if we take velocities that are very large uh, that you know uh, Newtonian mechanics uh, breaks down also when we're dealing with things that are moving very very fast um, I just said that yes when we're taking velocities that are very large or quantum mechanics that we're dealing with the very very small Newtonian physics breaks down so you know each at each stage, all we can say is we have an approximation of the laws of nature. We keep pushing it, pushing it, and we find out it's just an approximation. We go back to the drawing boards. But I do think we know that there are laws of nature. It's in our self-interest to discover the laws of nature. Um, I think, for example, we know on the basis of pretty solid science, not terribly sophisticated, um, that um, the clim that the uh, climate is, is warming. We understand why it's warming. We understand what carbon emissions are doing. It was interestingly uh, predicted on the basis of sheer theory um, in, I think, 1896 by a Swedish uh, physicist, uh, Arenas, uh, who said, you know, this could happen in like another 400 years, right? You know, that uh, burning coal and such things are going to trap uh, moisture, uh, going to create a ceiling, trap moisture, and it's all going to warm up. Um, you know, it happened a little faster than he thought, but I think we know this, and we know why it happened. It was predicted. Uh, so I think we know that there are laws of nature, uh, that they govern physical reality, um, and that we know some of these uh, physical laws well enough to uh, make predictions and, and to try to counteract what is bad for the survival of our planet and all the creatures on it. I think we really know this. 
I don't think it's, I think that some of the um, uh, controversies that took place in very much in the 1960s, 1970s around Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, big book, most assigned book still uh, in American uh, universities, you know, that you know, there's, you know, science doesn't make progress, that it's always, you know, there are these paradigm shifts that are akin to a religious conversion, and you just change your frame, you change the game, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think I think this was wrong. It was very, very fashionable. Uh, and um, and it, was, uh, it seeped out into the intellectual atmosphere in such a way that uh, people, you know, doubted the expertise of science in any way. I mean, you know, I think that was wrong. Here's another sphere altogether. You know, I think we know that slavery is wrong. It took us a really long time to figure that out. Great, great thinkers uh, like Plato and Aristotle, these great moral thinkers um, that we tend to revere, you know, Alfred North Whitehead said, all of the whole history of Western philosophy consists of footnotes to Plato. Well, he started a methodology, but he didn't know. He never thought to question the institution of slavery. I think we know uh, that it's wrong. Uh, it's absolutely wrong for people to take possession of other people. Nobody has the right to do that. I think we know a lot of things about rights. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm so two quite different examples, one scientific one moral, and I think that we know these things. Um, there's a real breakdown for me. That's the most fundamental breakdown for me uh, when people when people claim, uh, you know, that there is no such thing as objective truth, which is not to say that there's absolute truth. Sometimes some things are absolutely true. Some things I think it's absolutely true. For example, uh, that slavery is wrong. I think that's absolutely true. Uh, no exceptions. Um, but. Um, um, you know, so it's, but it's not to equate these uh, two concepts of objective truth and absolute truth, and nor is it to ever, you know, equate the notion that there's truth with a claim that we know it. You know, we're in a the absolute privileged position to, to, to claim it at this moment that we know, know it. These are all three separate kinds of claims. It's perhaps relevant um, that I grew up in a very religious household. Um, and um, a fundamentalist kind of household. Um, and I was constantly being told, this is the way the world is, you know, there's this God and he wants you to do this, and he wants you to do that, and that, you know, and, and, and he did this, that, and the other. And, um, and I always would, uh, my first instinct was always to say, how do you know that? How do you know that that's true? And um, it was such, it seems to me so very basic when people were telling me all of these things and saying this is how you have to live your life uh, because we know this to be true. How do you know it? But I was quite sure that it was either true or it wasn't. Um, and that I needed to try, you know, that that intuition, yes, it's, for these propositions, they're either true or they're not. It's not that it's true for my family, but not true for my fam the family next door uh, who, who believe differently. They believe that I, I had to accept Jesus Christ as my my, my savior is going to go to hell. That was quite a different belief than what my parents, who were Jewish, believed. Um, one of them was wrong. One of them, they couldn't both be right. That seemed to me, yeah, from the earliest age. So uh, that's my deepest intuition, that, that, that uh, you know, when people assert certain things, uh, they're either right or wrong. I know my husband, for example, he doesn't like chocolate. He thinks it tastes terrible. I think it's the most divine taste in the world. Is one of us right or wrong? No. About that, you know, you, you know, about taste, there is no dispute, right? Uh, there is, there's no objective fact of the matter. But in certain realms, yes. I mean, I'm either going to go to hell or not because I have not accepted Jesus as my as my savior. Um, I either will or I won't, you know. And. Uh, it's, it's, there's an objective truth there. So where does it come from? It comes from my earliest childhood, being told all sorts of things were true, wondering you know, how people could know that this, these things were true, and being sure that they were either true or false. Now, to me, that just seems like logic. Um, other people would dispute that. For more debates, talks, and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas 
at IAI TV.